Good. So, well, welcome to uh, the uh, June's uh, meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society. Uh, online, I believe you're not seeing me at the moment, you're seeing the slide, uh, all, all very well. Uh, we have a full house here at the uh, Briars, almost, uh, to uh, capacity. Um, almost 16 people here, which uh, is, is pretty, pretty astounding. Um, for those of you watching from uh, the comfort of your home, uh, you're doing so uh, nice and safely at a very big distance, uh, so uh, keep safe. Um, on the, the front, the front uh, slide here, uh, it's, uh, it's showing a, a, a recent image from uh, a couple of months ago actually from a professional observatory in Chile. And um, some of you may realise what those things are uh, that have ruined their astro uh, photograph that was uh, taken there. Um, those are actually Starlink satellites uh, going across uh, the, uh, the field of view. And a uh, very, very sad, uh, sad state of affairs there. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Okay. Right, so um, welcome any uh, new members uh, to uh, the society in uh, very, very unusual times. Usually we would uh, welcome you in person as best uh, we can and uh, hopefully uh, if you have joined uh, in the last uh, three or four months we'll get to meet you face to face at some stage, particularly as we're now able to meet in smaller numbers uh, up here at uh, the Briars. Um, tonight I'll go through um, uh, the events that have happened over the past month. There haven't been a lot of society events for obvious reasons, but uh, a few other things have uh, happened along the way. Then um, I'll, uh, I'll share with you a public lecture on um, uh, the science of how fireworks work, all about fireworks, so uh, that's a very interesting one from the Royal Institution in uh, London, given by uh, one of their visiting uh, professors. Uh, then we'll have a, uh, a 10 minute tea break afterwards and uh, then come back for Mark uh, talking with his uh, Sky for the month and followed by uh, a video that uh, Sky has sent in, she's not here in person uh, tonight, um, all about uh, orbits and then a few uh, other videos, I'll show science videos on things to do with uh, the eye for example and things like floaters and yes floaters are to do with the eye. Uh, and then. Uh, to, uh, to close the meeting, um, we'll uh, have uh, something that's been sent in by um, a, a young scientist who will probably be speaking to us early next year, and uh, she's an immunologist and uh, she'll uh, sing us out at the end of uh, the, uh, the evening. So recently, what's, uh, what's been happening? Uh, well, Absolutely no public nights, absolutely no scout or guide nights or any school nights. And in fact, the only school night that we had uh, booked uh, was uh, um, uh, cancelled, obviously, because of uh, the COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, so none of those have occurred. Um, the highlight, I guess, was the committee meeting held back in uh, May. And um, as you might imagine, uh, the, the, meeting, uh, the meeting the committee was going to talk about uh, the plans and how we actually reopen up the site again as soon as the restrictions are relaxed. Oops, there's somebody else coming in. Let me uh, mute again. There we go. Um, we uh, uh, opened up here on the 6th of June, which is a Saturday, to um, help uh, uh, take a lot of the stuff out of storage and put the instruments uh, back into uh, the observatory and just uh, generally uh, tidy it up. So get rid of the mice and, uh, and those sort of things uh, from, from the buildings and the cobwebs and everything. Um, on the, so the 6th of June went, uh, went quite well, put up um, posters and that. Um, you would have seen uh, Dave's article in uh, eScorpius about, uh, e about the weather station that was uh, installed uh, a few weeks prior to then, uh, as well as uh, some uh, cameras on site uh, as well. Uh, comet activity, I haven't actually seen any of your comets myself, I don't know if they're naked eye at the moment or not, um, probably binoculars, you might, might get a fuzz on, uh, on one or two of them, I'm, get, I'm getting a few nods from the audience on that, but um, yeah, not, uh, that, not as spectacular as what uh, I, I would hope they might have been by, by now. Um, at the end of May, we had Bob and Doug go up into orbit. They're not members, but uh, they were a couple of astronauts uh, that were sent up there by uh, SpaceX, and they're up on the ISS, 
and uh, kicked out a couple of the astronauts that were up there who uh, came back. And they're uh, commercial visitors uh, up there on the, the uh, space station. The first time the Americans uh, have actually launched, it's about 2011, I think, uh, from their own soil to get up to the ISS. Uh, on the 9th of June, there was yet another batch of Starlink satellites uh, set up. So they were the ones that gave the nice streaks across the Astro photograph uh, from Chile on, uh, on the front slide uh, that I showed. And um, uh, of those Starlink satellites, uh, there are only a few hundred that have been put up to date. Uh, and there are 12,000 actually due in stage one and up to 42,000 of them by uh, the end. So uh, if you think uh, streaks across your astro photographs are, are bad at the moment, wait until the sky is absolutely full of them. And uh, so uh, not, uh, not too hopeful there. On the 13th of June, the Australian Air Force um, launched uh, a small satellite into space that uh, didn't get uh, much of a mention on the news, little CubeSat for uh, communications purposes. Interestingly, it wasn't launched from Australia, as you might have thought, with a space agency, but it was actually launched from New Zealand. So New Zealand, of course, is uh, well ahead of us uh, space-wise, but uh, hopefully we catch up soon. Uh, CSIRO uh, announced that they found the cleanest air on Earth during that uh, time period. And uh, what the cleanest air on Earth meant was that uh, when they uh, sampled the air around the edge of Antarctica on the Southern Ocean, they couldn't detect anything that wasn't a marine organism, DNA-wise, so they detected no DNA evidence of human presence on the planet, whereas everywhere else uh, that they've ever sampled, uh, they've always been able to detect um, uh, you know, anthropogenic uh, um, a footprint of, uh, of people in what they've been able to sample in the air. And uh, the large moon of uh, Saturn Titan, which is the one that you can readily see through a small telescope, has uh, been wandering off its uh, predict uh, predicted um, orbit and uh, they're not entirely sure why it is. So it's, um, it's not behaving as anticipated from the measurements from the, the Cassini craft uh, originally. And uh, that, that poses some questions as to, uh, is it interacting with the planet in some way that they haven't fully understood yet? Of course, the Cassini craft is no longer functioning at uh, Saturn since it did its uh, death dive uh, many years ago. Um, and uh, they actually determined this by looking at um, past uh, radio signals that, uh, that were transmitted back from it. And then they've tried to um, calculate the orbit uh, going forward and uh, it hasn't uh, actually worked. Oops. There we are. Now moving forward uh, between now and uh, the next meeting, on the, uh, the 20th of June, we have a, a members' night uh, here at the Briars. Obviously, same uh, restrictions with uh, you have to book before coming by email and have that confirmed back to you so uh, we don't uh, over, overcrowd the place. Uh, that's uh, the night before the winter solstice for us. And on the winter solstice, which is the following night, on the 21st of June, is a Guinness World Record attempt. Uh, some of you might be aware of that uh, already. Um, and this is uh, not only Australia-wide, but it's internationally. Um, the advertising of this within Australia, I think, has really been quite a bit late in the, in, in the piece. Uh, and what it involves is um, on the, the Sunday, you have to uh, sit through a 30-minute video that's only made available, uh, I think, on the Sunday to watch, which is this coming Sunday. Uh, and then you have to go and estimate when it gets dark that evening um, uh, the limiting magnitude outside and how you do it is you uh, find the Southern Cross, most people can find crux in the sky without any problems, uh, and then compare what you see with uh, images that they uh, show you on the screen. So you have to actually launch an app. Uh, I don't think the app actually runs successfully on your phone directly, but you have to run it from a browser. So uh, you, know, you bring up Safari or something like that so actually on your phone. Uh, and then submit that. And uh, the idea is uh, they're going for the, the largest number of them. There's a Guinness World Record. Uh, you can run the app any time, of course, but you won't count as part of the Guinness World Record unless you do this um, uh, pre-30 minute uh, video watching on, on how to do it. And they probably tell you all about um, light pollution and what it is as well. So they'll take that opportunity to uh, educate the masses as to what, what the truth of life is of uh, the night time. Um, committee meeting uh, is the Wednesday after, and then at the end of uh, 
the end of the month on the 29th and the 30th of June for those that are really keen at 12.30 at night our time and 3am in the morning there's some free workshops being run on how to avoid the Starlink uh, satellites um, uh, with uh, astronomy and uh, this is um, a collaboration of uh, not only astronomers and uh, lighting technicians around the world but um, also um, people that advocate for dark sky nights as well which tend to be more the amateur community so this is a free series of online workshops unfortunately it's obviously time for uh, US and uh, European uh, audiences uh, primarily, but uh, I show you that there for the keen ones. And uh, the next meeting uh, here on the 15th of July, and uh, we're probably going to have the same restrictions in place if the four square metre rule is here. So even though gatherings indoors might be um, 100 or 200 or whatever they end up being by then, um, ultimately the square metre rule will be the limiting factor uh, in our case and the same indeed for many venues that have opened up the businesses as well. Uh, so on the 15th of July, we'll have Rosemary Marbling come down from Monash, and she's confirmed that she'll uh, be coming uh, to uh, speak about the uh, anniversary of uh, Einstein at that meeting. So if you intend to come to that meeting, please remember to book early. I think there are still four or five spots that are left, so only four or five seats left. So if you're wanting to come, um, please do. We might um, potentially be able to uh, stream again, assuming everything goes uh, goes well, so you'll be able to watch uh, remotely if we can, or if for some reason that fails, then uh, it'll be on YouTube uh, after the fact as well. And uh, last uh, meeting, uh, which was an online meeting, uh, I, I showed the date uh, incorrectly on the slide for the uh, geology visit to um, Point Leo for members and their family. It's actually on the 21st of November, which is a Saturday, and uh, I think I'd shown it incorrectly the 16th of November in the slides uh, last time. Right, so uh, for tonight's talk, uh, it's going to be given by um, a, a professor from Edinburgh, uh, Professor uh, Chris Bishop. Interestingly, he's a, he's a professor in artificial intelligence and uh, computer systems, and uh, he's extremely knowledgeable on fireworks, as it turns out. And um, this, uh, this is one that's uh, given by um, the Royal Institution, which is the uh, primary uh, institution in London of uh, scientists across uh, all natural disciplines. And uh, it's all about uh, fireworks. So if I get the technology on this right, we'll hopefully be able to uh, pick that one off uh, successfully. Hello and welcome to this lecture on the science of fireworks. Now fireworks are very popular, but they can also illustrate some very interesting ideas in science. This is called an ice fountain. It looks as if it's white hot, but actually I can pass my hand through the flame. Something of course you should never do with a regular firework. And the reason is that this is based on a different kind of chemistry. And we'll see how that chemistry was discovered in an accident in a 19th century kitchen. We'll also see how an ancient Chinese recipe involving honey led to the development of gunpowder. And we'll see how the bangs made by fireworks have their origins in photography. Now, of course, you should never pass your hand through the flame of a firework. And indeed, in this lecture, please do not try to copy any of the demonstrations that you see at home afterwards. Um, if you do, uh, that's the sort of thing that might happen. <laughs> so please do not try to copy any of the demonstrations. If you look at all these uh, explosions and bangs and flashes and you think, that looks like jolly good fun, uh, you're right, it is. It's jolly good fun, I have to say. And the way to do that, particularly you know, if you're a youngster, work hard at school, study science, work hard at your science, work hard at your mathematics, and become a professional scientist. And then, like me, you can actually be paid to have fun. Right? And that's the best thing about being a scientist, being paid to have fun. OK, so with that, we'll, we'll make a start. And we're going to look at gunpowder, because gunpowder is used 
in many kinds of fireworks, as we'll see. And also, of course, at this time of the year, we celebrate Guy Fawkes Night. We celebrate one of the most famous non-explosions in history. And that also was based on gunpowder. So gunpowder is a good place to start. As I'm sure you know, gunpowder has been around a very long time. It has its origins in China. And this is a part of a script from about 900 AD. It's called Essentials of the Mysterious Way of the True Origin. And uh, in this script, it says, some have combined sulfur with saltpeter and mixed them with honey and heated them so that flames have burst forth, even to the point of reducing their houses to cinders. <laughs> so even in 900 AD, people were saying, don't try this at home. <laughs> OK, now we're not at home. We're in the chemistry department. So I thought we would um, give this a go. So in this pot, I have a mixture of saltpeter, which uh, the chemical name of saltpeter is potassium nitrate. So this is potassium nitrate mixed together with honey and sulfur. So it's a lot of sticky yellow stuff. And I'm going to follow the instructions from the Chinese script. And we're going to heat this, and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to put that in the stand. And we'll, we'll light the Bunsen burner. And we'll have the light stand for this. And we're going to start to heat this mixture, and we'll see what happens as we heat it. So nothing much happening just yet, but, but inside that pot, the honey will be melting. It'll be sort of running together with the, the saltpeter and the sulfur. And uh, as the temperature starts to build up, something interesting is happening. A sort of very primitive kind of firework. So we're seeing some combustion, some chemistry going on. We're also seeing some smoke being produced, and we'll talk about that later. And so this is sort of very early kind of firework, if you like. But it certainly wasn't an explosion. We think of gunpowder as an explosive. We think of gunpowder as making a bang, and that certainly didn't make a bang. Not only that, we actually had to heat it. We had to heat it for 10 or 20 seconds to get a reaction going. And that's not very good for making fireworks. And the problem, of course, is that that contains honey, and honey contains water. And usually water is not a very good thing to put into your pyrotechnic mixtures. So the real breakthrough came when somebody discovered that you could replace the honey with a different ingredient, in particular with charcoal. And so this leads us to the three ingredients of gunpowder. We can just have a look at these here. So we have the, the saltpeter, or the potassium nitrate, and that's just this white crystalline powder. We have uh, charcoal, which is this black powder. You're familiar with charcoal. It's the sort of stuff you get on bits of partly burned wood, the black stuff. And this lovely yellow powder, this is sulfur. OK, so those are the three ingredients, then, of gunpowder. And let's just have a little look at those ingredients in turn. We'll start with potassium nitrates. Now, potassium nitrate is a chemical compound of potassium and nitrogen and oxygen. We can think of it as a, as a very concentrated form of oxygen. So when a piece of paper burns in the air, it's undergoing a chemical reaction with the oxygen, which is about one-fifth of the air. But the air is very thin, and potassium nitrate contains a very concentrated form of oxygen. In fact, we call it an oxidizer. And so what I've done is to dissolve some potassium nitrate in water, and I've painted a shape on this piece of paper. I've allowed it to dry. And if I just light this... Right, we can see the shape beginning to emerge there. What's happening is that where I've painted the potassium nitrate, it's reacting with the paper. It's undergoing combustion, but the oxygen is coming not from the air, but from the decomposition of the potassium nitrate. So the potassium nitrate is acting as a source of oxygen. Now, can anybody see what shape? What is it? Uh, K. K. Right, K, it's the letter K. Why have I chosen the letter K? Who knows? So definitely to do with chemistry, yes. Any other thoughts? Last letter, last letter of firework. Last letter of firework, that's a great answer. There's a, there's a, there's a more sort of chemical answer. Brilliant, it's the symbol for potassium. K is the symbol for potassium. And so this is potassium nitrate. 
So potassium nitrate, then, is the source of oxygen for the combustion processes that go on in fireworks. So that's potassium, potassium nitrate. The second ingredient is charcoal. Now, charcoal is made by taking wood and heating it in the absence of air, and it decomposes into sort of black material, and that black material chemically is mostly carbon. So let's just have a little look at carbon. This is a model of uh, a very interesting and useful kind of carbon. It's diamond. So each of these black spheres represents an atom of carbon, and in diamond, they're arranged in this very rigid lattice structure. So diamond is a very hard material. Here's another kind of diamond. This is called, uh, sorry, another kind of carbon. This is called carbon-60, or a buckyball. It has 60 carbon atoms in a, in a sphere with these lovely pentagons and hexagons, just like a football, and somebody won the Nobel Prize for discovering that. But the most common and the most, I suppose, mundane form of carbon is called graphite. So the lead, the so-called lead in your pencil, it's not made of lead at all, it's made of graphite. And in graphite, the atoms are arranged in these sheets, and the sheets can kind of slide over each other. So it's a very soft material, very, very different from, uh, from diamond. And charcoal, right down at the atomic level, is really mostly graphite. But there's something else that's rather special about charcoal, and uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. And the third ingredient is sulphur, that lovely yellow powder. And sulphur has the property that it has quite a low melting point, and sulphur is there to help the combustion. So the gunpowder burns much better if we uh, include some sulphur. OK, so we know the ingredients of gunpowder then. We've got potassium nitrate, charcoal, and sulphur. But before we can make some gunpowder, we need to know the proportions. What proportions should we mix these ingredients together in order to make really good gunpowder? Well, to understand that, what we're going to do is, first of all, look at some much simpler chemistry. We're going to simply look at the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. So, does anybody know what happens when hydrogen reacts with oxygen? Any? Yes? Excellent. So, when hydrogen reacts with oxygen, it forms water. Something else is also released when that happens. Anybody, anybody know? No, any other guesses? Not quite. Something else. Something else happens when we combine hydrogen and oxygen. I tell you what, we're going to do it and we'll find out. Okay, we'll find out what happens when we combine hydrogen with oxygen. But let's just have a look first of all at what happens to those molecules. So on the left here is a molecule of hydrogen. It has two hydrogen atoms joined together, bound together in the molecule. Another molecule of hydrogen at the right, and in the middle is a molecule of oxygen, and that has two atoms of oxygen. Now, if we give a bit of energy to this, we can break those bonds. That bit of energy is called the activation energy. So we provide a bit of energy, it breaks the bonds, and then the atoms can rearrange themselves and they can form new bonds. And as somebody uh, said earlier, they form water. So water is H2O. And when those new bonds form, that releases a great deal of energy, much more than that little bit of activation energy that we put in. So the other thing that happens when hydrogen combines with oxygen, it makes water and it releases energy. And so here is the, the way we'd write this as a chemical equation. It says, uh, so H2, H with a little 2 underneath, is that molecule of hydrogen with two atoms of hydrogen. So two molecules of hydrogen combined with one molecule of oxygen to make two molecules of water. So the prediction then is that the best reaction between hydrogen and oxygen will happen when we have twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. So what we're going to do is a little experiment to test that theory. So Chris has been filling some balloons with various mixtures of hydrogen and oxygen. What we're going to do is set fire to these, and then we'll compare them to see how fast they react. And uh, you'll notice that I've got a pair of ear defenders, and that's because my prediction is they'll react really rather well, and we'll get quite a loud bang from some of these balloons. Now, what I want you to do is to uh, listen to see how loud the explosions are. Okay? The louder the bang, the better the reaction. And our prediction is that the loudest bang, the best reaction, will happen when we have twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. Now, I'm going to wear ear defenders. You might like either to put your fingers in your ears or just cover your ears with your palms. So this first balloon is mostly oxygen, just a little bit of hydrogen, mostly oxygen. So let's see what this sounds like. OK, so here we go. Are you ready? 
OK, that wasn't very loud, I think you'll agree. OK, let's try a balloon now, which is mostly hydrogen. Mostly hydrogen, just a little bit of oxygen. So we'll see if this is any louder than the last one. Thank you, Chris. You ready? OK, that was, yes, yeah, all right, a little bit better. All right, thank you, Chris. So that was mostly hydrogen and just a little bit of oxygen. And what we're going to do now is to try two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. So the prediction is that this should be the loudest bang. So we'll see if the prediction is correct. OK, so here we go. OK. So I think it's pretty clear then that the, the two to one mixture I think was definitely the loudest of those three. So what that says is that to get the fastest reaction we should have the, the, the fuel, in that case the hydrogen, and the oxygen in just the right balance. There's just enough fuel to match up with the oxygen. In that case it was two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. OK, what about uh, gunpowder or black powder then? So in the, in the world of pyrotechnics, we, we often call gunpowder black powder. So if I say black powder, it means exactly the same thing as gunpowder. So for gunpowder or black powder then, what should the proportions be? Well, the, long before people understood the chemistry, they had worked out the best proportions just by trial and error. And it's pretty, pretty well accepted now that the best proportions for, for making really good gunpowder is to have 75% of potassium nitrate, 15% of charcoal, and 10% of sulphur. And then they will react in the fastest possible way. And here is the chemistry of the reaction of gunpowder, and I'll test you all on this later. Um, the, the one thing we can, apart from the fact this is very complicated, much more complicated than the hydrogen and oxygen, if we look at this, we can also see that certain things are formed, things like potassium carbonate, potassium sulphate, ammonium carbonate, these are substances which are solids at room temperature. And that means this reaction produces smoke. So one of the things we'll see is that we, when we burn gunpowder, we get smoke. And that's why we've got this special safety screen that also um, sucks away the smoke for us. So we know the ingredients of gunpowder. We know the proportions. So now we're ready to make some gunpowder. So what we'll do is we'll make 10 grams of, of gunpowder. So to make 10 grams of gunpowder, we need to start with... Uh, seven and a half grams of potassium nitrate. So there's seven and a half grams of potassium nitrate. So that's uh, 75%. We now need 15% or one and a half grams of charcoal. That's the, the black powder, so we'll tip that in. And now we need, last of all, 10% sulfur. So one gram of sulfur. So those are the ingredients of gunpowder. I've put them in a beaker, and I'm now going to stir these around and get them thoroughly mixed. And at this point, we're hoping, aren't we, that this is really, really good gunpowder. So I've used really top quality potassium nitrate, really good quality sulfur, and the charcoal is willow charcoal, and that's reckoned to be the best for making gunpowder. So we've got the, exactly the right ingredients, we've mixed them in exactly the right proportions, I'm stirring them around really thoroughly. So this really ought to be really, really top quality gunpowder. So we'll, we'll see how well this, this burns. Now, I could just sort of set fire to this and see what happens, but I want to be a little bit more scientific. I want to try to measure how good this gunpowder is. So to do that, I'm going to spread the powder in this track, and then what we're going to do is to light the powder at one end and watch the powder burn along the track. Now, we're after a fast reaction. So the faster the powder burns along the track, the better. So what I want you to do, when I light this, once you see the gunpowder start to burn, I want you to start counting, just in your heads, yourselves, start counting, see how many seconds it takes for the gunpowder to burn from one end of the track to the other. Remember, the faster, the better. Now, at the end there, we've got a little fuse, so I'm going to light the fuse, the fuse will burn for a few seconds, and then you'll see the gunpowder light, and just count to yourselves how long it takes to burn along the track. I think we have the lights down for this, please.
Okay, so there's the fuse burning. There's the gunpowder burning. Okay, I made that about sort of 12 or 13 seconds, something like that. So, you know, maybe it's kind of disappointing. This is supposed to be an explosive, and it took about 13 seconds to get along the track there. So something is wrong. There's something wrong with our gunpowder. We haven't made really good gunpowder, even though we thought we were going to. And what's the problem? Well, this could be one of the problems. Imagine looking at that down a, down a microscope. What sort of thing would we see? Well, we'd see something like this. Those fine particles are really, on, a, on an atomic scale, they're very large. We see a huge white boulder of potassium nitrate. And then some distance away, there'd be a huge sort of yellow boulder of sulfur. And these chemicals have to come into contact with, it, with each other in order to react. And there are very few points of contact. So it could be that the size of the particles has something to do with the rate of reaction. If we could somehow make these particles very much smaller and get them really mixed up well together, perhaps this would burn a lot faster. OK, so that's the theory. We should now test the theory. And we'll test the theory using uh, this yellow powder. It's called lycopodium. So it's a natural material. And it contains a lot of fats. And it should be quite flammable. So what I'm going to do is to put a little bit of this lycopodium on the uh, dish, on the plate here. And we'll see if we can set fire to this. OK, so I'm just going to try and set fire to the powder. And it's sort of burning. We're getting a bit of a flame. Uh, I've got a little flame there. It's just burning. I don't know if you can see. There's a tiny little flame. Not very spectacular, I think you'll agree. The reason, of course, is that the burning of the lycopodium is a chemical reaction between the powder and the oxygen from the air. And that reaction can only occur with the the air comes into contact with the powder, and that's only at the surface. So our theory is that if we can get a much better mixing between the fuel and the oxygen, we'll get a much faster combustion. So we're going to test that now by burning some more lycopodium, but this time we're first of all going to mix the lycopodium thoroughly with the air, and then we're going to light it, and we'll see if it burns a bit faster. So in this tube is some lycopodium, and I'm going to puff some air through the tube, and we'll see if we get a, a slightly faster reaction this time. OK. Thank you. OK, so that suggests then that to make our gunpowder burn a bit faster, what we need to do is to mix the ingredients together rather more thoroughly. So let me show you then how commercial gunpowder is made. And this is a picture of a, a piece of equipment from a catalogue from about 1900 from a company that manufactured gunpowder-making machines. And this is a, a, a key step in the manufacture of gunpowder. This is called an incorporating machine. And I want you to get some idea of the scale of this. Those rollers are six and a half feet in diameter. They each weigh 10 tonnes. And this is used to grind the powder for about three hours. Now, that's going to do a much more thorough job than I did with the beaker and the stick in about half a minute. In fact, not only does it make the particles very small and mix them together very thoroughly, it does something else as well that's rather special. And this comes back to the, the nature of charcoal. It turns out that if you make gunpowder using chemically very pure carbon, like graphite powder, it doesn't work very well. There's something special about charcoal, which is this natural material made from wood. And this is a picture of some charcoal taken with an electron microscope. And the top left image is about a millimetre from one side to the other. And then we zoom in and zoom in. And what we see is this sponge-like structure. Right? This is a, a natural structure because it's a natural material. And the process of incorporation, the grinding for hours and hours with those massive rollers, is actually forcing potassium nitrate and sulphur into all these little nooks and crannies in that sponge-like structure. And that's one of the reasons why uh, gunpowder burns as fast as it does. So that's how commercial gunpowder is made. So let's have a look at some commercial gunpowder and see if it burns a little bit faster than the, than the gunpowder we made earlier. So again, we're going to measure this using the track. So again, I have 10 grams of gunpowder, so it's the same quantity as last time. But now, this is a very top quality commercial gunpowder. So this is the best gunpowder that you can get. 
And again, I'm going to sprinkle it along the track over a similar length to last time. And again, we've got a little fuse to light this. When the fuse burns to the end, you'll see the gunpowder burn. And again, I want you to count to yourselves uh, how long it takes to burn from one end to the other. And I think last time the, the handmade gunpowder took about something like 13 seconds. So what we'll see is, is if this is any faster. We're hoping this will go a little bit faster than that 13 seconds that we had before. So again, we'll pop the lights down. Okay, so there's the fuse. And start counting once you see the powder burning. Okay. <laughs> so, just a little bit faster. Okay, so that was a lot better. That was maybe half a second or so. So it was at least 10 times faster, or maybe 20 times faster, than my handmade gunpowder. So much, much better. And that's as good as gunpowder gets. But it's still not an explosion. It still took a half a second or so to burn. In an explosion, we have a very rapid release of energy in a tiny fraction of a second. So how can we get our gunpowder to burn even faster than in that track? Well, to understand how to do that, what we're going to do is have a look again at that simpler chemistry, the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. So this is what we might see if we imagine being able to look down an incredibly powerful microscope at those molecules. The white molecules here are molecules of hydrogen. Remember, two hydrogen atoms stuck together to make a hydrogen molecule. And the red ones are oxygen molecules, two oxygen atoms stuck together to make a molecule of oxygen. Now, you see they're all moving around. Now, that's heat. Heat is just the motion of molecules and atoms. All the atoms and molecules in the world are all moving around. In solids, they sort of jiggle around. In gases, they're moving around like this. And the higher the temperature, the faster they're moving. And from time to time, they bump into each other. And if they bump into each other with enough energy, remember that activation energy we talked about before, enough energy to break the bonds, we get a reaction. And that's shown here by a little explosion. So every now and again, you'll see, like there, you'll see a little yellow explosion. Okay, that's when they bump into each other with enough energy to reach that activation energy. So what we want to do is to speed up this reaction. How can we make this reaction go faster? Any ideas on how to make this go faster? Yes. Heat it. Brilliant. Right, so if we heat it up, what will happen? Well, as we raise the temperature, as I'm doing here, we increase the speed. And now... A lot more of those collisions have enough energy to reach that activation energy. And so we get a higher rate of reaction. So heating it up should increase the rate of the chemical reaction. There's something else we could do as well. Instead of heating it up, we could increase the density. So if we increase the density, each hydrogen atom sees a lot more oxygen atoms and vice versa. And so again, we get an increase in reaction rate. So our second prediction is that increasing the density or the concentration should also speed up the reaction. And of course, we could do both. We could increase the density and increase the temperature, and then we should get a really good reaction. OK, so those are our two predictions then. So what we need to do now is to test out the predictions. So our first prediction is that a chemical reaction should go faster when it's hotter. So to test out this, what I would like are two volunteers. Oh, you're very keen. You come on down and just uh, wait there at the bottom of the stairs. Let's have somebody from this side who would like to volunteer. Uh, let's have... Would you like to come on down? Yes, come on down. Let's have a big hand for our volunteers. <laughs> let's come this way. Right, so if you'd like to stand just about there. And if you just want to pop on a pair of safety goggles... That's good. And if our other volunteer would like to come and stand, if you'd like to come and stand over here, we have a pair of safety goggles for you as well. And what's your name? Karina. Karina. Here we go. She's going to pop those on. If you come and stand just there. What's your name? Ben. Ben. All right, Ben, you hold this. This is a light stick, and you have a light stick as well. Have you used light sticks before? Have you used a light stick before? 
Don't worry, I'll show you how to use it. Right. What we've got are two identical light sticks, and we've got two beakers of water. Now, this beaker of water has got ice in it, so it's very cold, and this beaker of water is pretty hot. So these are at different temperatures. And what we're going to do is we're going to start the light sticks, and then we're going to put them in the uh, beakers, change their temperatures, and we'll see what effect that has on the rate of reaction. Now, the reaction, the chemical reaction in a light stick, of course, is producing light. So the faster the reaction, the more light it should produce. So let's test this out. So what I want you to do is take your light stick like this. Uh, here we go, like this, right in the middle like that. We're going to do a snap it, okay? I'll go three, two, one, give it a big hard snap. Three, two, one, snap. Really hard snap. Go on. Ah, ah. Oh. Go for it. Yes, well done. And you, big hard, big hard snap. I'm sure you can do it. So I'll give it a little bit of a little bit of a help. Well done. Okay. Give it a good shake and pop it in. Just give yours a little bit of a shake. That's it. Pop it in the water. Okay, so we're going to leave that there for a few minutes while they, while they adjust to their temperatures and we'll, we'll see then whether temperature has an effect on reaction rate. So you two just wait there a moment. And our other prediction was that increasing the density should increase the reaction rate. And for this, I'd like to have three volunteers, please. Um, you were fast there. Yes, you come on down. Uh, you're very keen. And let's have somebody from over here. Yes, why don't you come on down? So a handful of volunteers, please. Uh, yes, if you'd like to come and stand there, please, you just wait there a second. And uh, we've got some safety goggles. So if you pop those on, uh, if you'd like to come and stand there, pop on a pair of safety goggles. We need a pair for you, don't we? Here we go. You put those on. Right, what's your name? Will. You're Will. What's your name? Agnes. Agnes, and you are? Matthew. Matthew, right. So in these cylinders at the front, we've got solutions of sodium hypochlorite. And sodium hypochlorite is the active ingredient in bleach. So this is really like a, a solutions of bleach. And in this cylinder, we've got 400 milliliters of sodium hypochlorite solution. In this cylinder, we've got 200 milliliters of sodium hypochlorite plus 200 milliliters of water. So the concentration in this cylinder is just half the concentration in this cylinder. And finally, in the third cylinder, we've got 100 milliliters of sodium hypochlorite plus 300 milliliters of water. So this is half again. So as you go from here to here, the concentration or the density of bleach goes down by, by two. And going from here to here, it goes down by another factor of two. Each of our three volunteers has a, a beaker containing water with blue food colouring in. And these three beakers are identical. So in a moment, we're going to pour the, uh, the water containing the blue food colouring into the cylinders. And what will happen is the sodium hypochlorite should bleach the blue food colouring. And we'll look at the rate at which that happens. So what I want you to do is to take, uh, take a beaker each. Okay, if you pick up your beaker, and then at more or less the same time, if you come and stand just about there, around the front, now can you reach over the top? Can you reach over the top there and pour it in, do you think, if you stand a bit closer? Okay, everybody ready? So you're going to pour yours into there, okay? Can you manage? Good. Okay, off you go then, start pouring. That's it, pour it all in. Super job. All right, pop the beakers down. Now, what's happening now is that the sodium hypochlorite should be bleaching the dye, and we should start to see some changes in the colours of these three solutions. And I think already this one at the end here has pretty much been bleached. That's gone pretty clear. The one in the middle is losing its colour. It's not quite as uh, blue as it was. That's getting bleached quite nicely. And the one at the end is starting to lose its colour. But what you can see is the bleaching is happening fastest in the solution of the highest concentration, and it's happening slowest in the solution of lowest concentration. So again, that tells us that if we increase the density or the concentration, that increases the rate of chemical reaction. Okay, let's go and have a look at our light sticks. So would you two like to fetch your life sticks, light sticks out and just hold them up, and we'll have a look. We just dim the lights a little bit, hold them up nice and high. I think you can see the one that's been in the hot water is glowing very brightly. The one that's in the cold water is not glowing quite so brightly. Just hold them up together like that. Okay, good. Okay, pop them back in the beakers. And if you take your glasses off and go back to your seats, we'll have a big hand for our volunteers. Okay, so we've got a, two predictions there, which were confirmed by experiment. 
which tell us that a reaction will go faster if we raise the temperature, and it will go faster if we increase the density. So let's apply that, uh, those scientific principles to the combustion of gunpowder and see if we can make our gunpowder burn a bit faster. So let's think about what was happening when the gunpowder was burning in that long track. As the gunpowder burns, it releases heat, it releases energy, it produces hot gases, and those gases are simply expanding. They're just pushing back against the atmosphere. They can expand easily. And so as they expand, the temperature can drop, the temperature can fall, the density can fall, and so the reaction rate uh, remains relatively slow. What we can do instead is to take some gunpowder and confine it in a very tight container. Now, as the gunpowder reacts, the energy is released, these hot gases are produced, but they can't escape. And because they're confined, the density can't fall, and the temperature can increase, the reaction rate can increase. And as the reaction rate increases, it increases the rate of energy production, which increases the temperature, which increases the reaction rate even more. And we call this thermal runaway. And our prediction then is that if we confine the gunpowder, we should get this rapidly increasing reaction rate leading to a fast reaction. So again, we're going to try that out. In order to do that, I've actually reduced the quantity of gunpowder from 10 grams down to just one gram, uh, for reasons which will become apparent. <laughs> and this time, the one gram of gunpowder is in this uh, cardboard tube, which is tightly bound up. So it's in a very tight, strong container. And I'm going to put my ear defenders on for this. And again, you might wish to cover your ears at this point as we test out this theory. So this is one gram of gunpowder, tightly confined now. So I think you'll agree then that confining the gunpowder greatly increased the rate of reaction. And this is a very important concept in pyrotechnics and in fireworks, that when we confine uh, pyrotechnic compositions, they burn very much faster. And in some cases, we can get an explosion, as we've seen. So there we had a bang. We had a bang from confined gunpowder. Now, if we actually want to make bangs deliberately, as often we do in fireworks, Using gunpowder and confining it is not very convenient. We have to use quite a lot of gunpowder, and we have to have big, strong containers. It's not a very good way of producing bangs. So although gunpowder is very important in fireworks, and you'll find out why in a moment, we don't use gunpowder to make bangs. We use a different kind of chemistry. And the chemistry for this uh, goes back a long way. In fact, it goes back to the world of photography, the, the very early days of photography, before we had digital cameras and so on, when um, chemicals were used to do photography, and also chemistry was used to produce light, because often you want to take a photograph in, indoors or at night time, and you need some artificial source of light. And it was in the days before electric light, and so people had to find an alternative. And they discovered that if you burn certain metals, they'll burn with a very bright light. And so this is a piece of magnesium, a little strip of magnesium, I'm going to set fire to this now, and it'll burn with the oxygen in the air, and you'll see it produces a bright light. In fact, you, you may not wish to look directly at this because it really is extremely bright. So this just takes a moment or two to get going. And there it is, burning away. So there's the magnesium burning with the oxygen in the air, and that white smoke is magnesium oxide that's being produced. Okay. And you see that very bright light. And so that could be used for taking photographs. Now, although the light is very bright, that was burning quite slowly. And usually when we want to take a photograph, we want the photograph to be very fast because we want to stop any sort of motion. We don't want any blurring. So we want to get that light released much more quickly. And so photographers developed something called flash powder. And flash powder, again, is based on burning of metals. But now we use that idea of an oxidizer, that is a solid material containing concentrated oxygen that can burn with the metals. And so what I'm going to show you now is quite an old recipe for flash powder that was used in the early days of photography, and it's based on powdered magnesium, you just saw magnesium burning, and also another metal, aluminium. So when aluminium is in a, the form of a very fine powder, it can also burn, it also produces a very bright light. And this time we're using a more powerful oxidizer. It's called potassium perchlorate. But again, it's a compound that contains a lot of oxygen. 
And so the oxygen from the potassium perchlorate will react with the magnesium and the aluminium, and what we'll get is a bright flash. Now, again, this is extremely bright. I recommend that you do not look directly at this. Instead, just look at your friends or look at some other part of the auditorium. We'll put the lights down, and we'll see if we can get a nice flash from this. OK, so when the lights are down, here we go. OK. <clears throat> OK, so that was flash as used for photography in the early days of photography. Now, the chemistry of that was rather different from the, the chemistry you, we used with the balloons. With the balloons, we found that the fastest reaction happened when we had just enough hydrogen to balance the amount of oxygen. In the flash powder there, there was a huge excess of fuel. There was lots and lots of magnesium, lots and lots of aluminium. And so as it burned, the oxidizer was used up very quickly, and most of that magnesium and aluminium was thrown up into the air and actually reacted with the oxygen in the air to produce light, because the goal of the photographic flash powder is to produce light, to produce a flash. But we can use that same kind of chemistry to produce our bangs for fireworks, and that's done by adjusting the proportions to make them balanced. So we have just the right amount of the metals to combine with the oxidizer. And so this leads to, I think, really quite a dramatic demonstration of the effect of confinement. Now, when we confined the gram of gunpowder, we got a nice bang. But you might have been thinking, well, all that was really happening is the pressure was building up slowly and building up and building up, and then the container burst. Did the reaction rate really increase as a result of confinement, or was it just a, a container bursting that made the bang? Well, this demonstration, I think, will convince you that the effect of confinement really is to increase reaction rate. So what I've got is one gram of pyrotechnic flash powder, and we're going to burn this on an open surface. And then in a moment, we're going to burn exactly the same quantity of exactly the same powder with a little bit of confinement, and we'll see the difference. So we'll leave the lights up for this, but again, um, this is quite bright, so you may prefer not to look at it directly. So this is one gram of flash powder just burning on an open surface. OK, so pretty similar to what we saw before. We had a bright flash, a little puff of smoke, not very much noise. What we're going to do now is take exactly the same quantity of exactly the same kind of flash powder, but this time we've put the powder in the bottom of a small cardboard tube. So this tube is closed off at the bottom, but it's open at the top. So this is very, very gentle form of confinement. What we're going to do is to just lay a business card across the top. So I'm wondering if somebody in the audience has a business card that I could, I'll say borrow. Um, you may not get it back. We'll see. Anybody have a business card? Somebody must have a business card. Somebody must have a business card. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, so what I'm going to do is to take this business card and just rest it gently on the top of that tube. So this is not a sealed container. This container can't withstand any pressure. It's just the business card laid, laid on the top. So there we go. So the same quantity of flash powder, but this time with some very gentle confinement. But this time, I'm going to put my ear defenders on, and I would recommend very much that you cover your ears for this. So this is how we make the bangs in fireworks. OK, here we go. OK, so I think that convinces you that um, a little bit of confinement really does accelerate the reaction. And this is, um, that's pretty much all that's left of that cardboard tube. And I'm afraid your business card didn't really do very well, but I'll let you have that back as a souvenir. <laughs> there we go. All right. So that's how we produce the bangs in, in our fireworks. Now... We want to produce lots of other effects in fireworks, of course, and one of the most important effects in fireworks is colour. Fireworks would be very boring if we didn't have colours. So how are we going to make coloured fireworks? 
Well, the secret again comes from chemistry, and it comes from adding compounds to our pyrotechnic mixture, compounds which are made from specific metals. So again, metals play an important role. And depending upon the particular metal we use, so we get a different colour. So to get red, we use strontium. To get orange, we use calcium. For yellow, we use sodium. For green, we use barium. For blue, we use copper. And to get a white flame, well, we've seen how to do that. We can use magnesium or aluminium. And there's another metal called titanium, which is also very good. In fact, the ice fountain that you saw at the beginning had little particles of titanium, and that gave those lovely branching white sparks. So let's look at an example of this. We'll look at the colour red, and we'll see how to make a, a simple red flare. So we're going to combine three ingredients. The first is that uh, oxidizer, potassium perchlorate, so the ATE at the end, the H, that tells you that this has got some oxygen in it. So this is our source of oxygen, our oxidizer. The fuel is something called a Croides resin. Now this is sort of sticky gum that oozes out of the bark of trees in Australia and it's sort of gathered up and dried and ground up into a powder and it turns out it makes a very good fuel for pyrotechnics. And then the third ingredient is where our colour comes from. This is strontium carbonate. Now strontium carbonate is just a white powder. It's not the colour of the powder, it's actually the strontium, the strontium atoms which will get into the flame and will emit this red light. So let's just have a little look at a, a simple flare then. A red flare made using that chemistry. So a lovely red colour caused by strontium. And any time that you see a firework producing a red colour, you can think to yourselves, yes, that's produced by strontium. OK, so we've seen how to make bangs, we've seen how to produce colours. What we really want to do is to make fireworks. So let's see how fireworks are made. Now, there are hundreds or maybe thousands of different kinds of fireworks. We don't have time to look at them all. So we're just going to look at one kind of firework. And it's the kind that's the most important for big professional displays. And this firework is called a shell. This is an example of a shell. And the shell goes into a tube. The tube is called a mortar. Uh, so the shell is lowered into the mortar. And when we're ready to, uh, to fire the firework, uh, a gunpowder charge at the base of the shell is ignited. And this then functions like a cannon. It shoots the shell, rather like a cannonball, straight into the air. And at the highest point, the shell explodes, and we get some lovely effect. And to see what's going on, let's just have a look at a cross-section through a shell. So there's the cross-section of our shell. And the first thing we have is a fuse. So the fuse is used to conduct the flame down into the shell. And the flame is, is sent down to the charge of gunpowder at the bottom. That's called the lifting charge. So that explodes, and that pushes the shell up the mortar and into the sky. And this is where we use gunpowder, black powder, rather than flash powder. Flash powder makes a very sharp bang, but gunpowder, when it explodes, is a softer explosion. It's more like a push, and it's good for pushing the shell up the mortar and into the sky. Now, that lifting charge also does something else as well. It sets fire to a delay fuse that produces a delay of a predetermined number of seconds. And when the shell is at the highest point, that delay fuse then lights another charge of gunpowder in the middle of the shell. That's called the bursting charge. And that bursting charge blows the shell apart. Also inside the shell, we have some kind of an effect. And often the effect takes the form of stars. So stars are like cylinders or spheres of compressed pyrotechnic mixture. And they're ignited by the bursting charge. And they might, for example, produce color. So they might be a bit like our red flare. You'd see the shell explode, or all these points of red light spreading out from the shell. OK, so we looked there at a four-inch shell. But if you really want to have some fun, then what you need is one of these. And this is called an eight-inch. This is an eight-inch mortar. And <laughs> the eight-inch mortar is used to fire this, which is an eight-inch shell. Now, I don't know if anybody would like to, maybe would like to just, just get hold of that and just uh, tell us, if it, is it heavy? <laughs> Seriously heavy. All right. 
So this is, this is quite a serious firework. In fact, when an 8-inch shell leaves the top of the mortar, it's travelling at 200 miles an hour. And it travels to a height of about 1,000 feet, and when it explodes, the diameter of the explosion is about 800 feet. And so this is a picture of a ground test of an 8-inch shell. There's the explosion. And if we zoom in on that small rectangle, we see a little smudge. That smudge is a 17-foot-long, one-ton truck. Just give you an idea of the scale. OK, so you're thinking, these look like a lot of fun. Where can I buy one of those? <laughs> and that leads us on to a discussion of uh, the categories of fireworks. So there are four categories of fireworks. Category one, indoor fireworks. Fireworks designed for use indoors. Category two, garden fireworks. So if you buy a firework designed to be used in the garden, somewhere on the side of the firework, it will say category two. And these can be viewed safely from a distance of at least five metres. Category three are called display fireworks. This is if you're having a big display in a park somewhere. These are larger fireworks, so you need to be further away. You need to be at least 25 metres away from uh, a Category 3 firework. But shells, all shells of any size, fall into Category 4. And Category 4 are professional fireworks. These are not on sale to the general public, and I, I think you'll understand the reason from that uh, photograph. There are no size restrictions, but they're not available to the general public. So all shells are, are Category 4. So shells are really the most important kind of firework for those big um, professional displays. And that's why those displays can produce these tremendous effects in the sky that you really can't achieve with the kinds of fireworks that you can buy in the shops. So the shell, of course, has to be ignited somehow, and it's ignited by this fuse. And fuses are very important in fireworks because we need to be able to set the firework off when we're some distance away. So we either need a, a delay or some way of lighting a firework that's some distance away from us. So let's just have a look at some different kinds of fuse. So first of all, we'll look at something called black match. Now, black match is a very old-fashioned, very primitive kind of fuse. It's no longer used today very much. But it's just a piece of string that's been coated in a sort of paste of gunpowder and water and allowed to dry. So when we light this, the gunpowder will burn along. And that gives us a little bit of a delay. We can light the fuse, and then we can get some distance away, and then the firework will go off. So that's a very old-fashioned kind of fuse. It's not a very good kind of fuse because sparks can jump ahead. And so you can't really tell how quickly it's going to burn. That's not very good. And if you've got two pieces nearby each other, the flame can jump from one to another. And if it gets damp, it, it will stop working completely. So that's black match. It's not really used today, except in one application. And that's in things like uh, shells, this leader on the shell, or any situation in which we want to transmit a flame very rapidly. So if we've got lots of fireworks and want them all to go off at the same time, we need a fast-burning fuse. And the way we can make a fast-burning fuse is to use that idea of confinement. We're going to take the black match, but this time we put it inside a loose-fitting paper tube, and now as the match burns, the flame can't expand, it's pushed along the tube, and that increases the speed of burning. So what we've done here is to take a section of black match, but instead of putting it inside a paper tube, it's now inside a clear plastic tube so that you can see what's happening. So we're going to put the lights down, and... I'm going to light this section of black match that's outside the tube. And as that black match burns along, the flame in a moment will go inside the tube. And you should be able to see it speed up a little bit. OK, here it goes. OK. <clears throat> so that's quick batch. That's how we get a flame from one place to another very rapidly. Now. What about if we actually want to produce a delay? What do we do if we want to light a fuse, wait a while, and then have the firework go off? Well, black match is, is not very good, as we've seen. Uh, in, when I was a, a youngster, fireworks used to have uh, blue touch paper. That's just like that uh, fire writing we did earlier. Blue touch paper is paper that's been soaked in potassium nitrate solution, allowed to dry, and when you light it, it smoulders along. Again, it's very primitive fuse. It's not very good. So these days, if you look at a firework, you'll see a little piece of green fuse, and this is called visco, and this is much better. And this is really just a, a tube containing compressed gunpowder. I just got a 
a torch. I'll just light this section of visco and you can see it burning along. So this is just a tube containing compressed gunpowder. So there it is burning along. It burns at a nice steady rate and it makes a very good safety fuse. Okay, so that's visco. But the problem with things like visco, visco, it, they put a sort of lacquer on to try to make it waterproof. But it get, if it gets wet, it's going to stop working because it just contains gunpowder. Gunpowder doesn't work when it gets wet. What are we going to do if we're in sort of the middle of November or November the 5th and it's a sort of a grey, rainy day and the field's all muddy and so on? We need some sort of fuse that isn't going to be affected by damp. And we can use this. It's called plastic igniter cord or PIC. And it actually has a, a waterproof plastic coating with a pyrotechnic composition down the middle. And this piece of PIC has actually been sitting in this bath of water for a few hours. And I'm going to light it and we'll see if it can continue to burn even underwater. So there it is burning away in the air. And now the flame's going into the water. And hopefully it will continue to burn. I think you can just see burning away underwater and in a moment we hope the flame will appear yes <laughs> okay so that is that's plastic igniter cord but the, the trouble with all of these things they all involve fire and flame and they're all a little bit uh, primitive in some way if we want a nice modern firework display we need a lot more control over the uh, setting off of the fireworks and so we don't use uh, PIC and visco and that sort of thing anymore, we do everything electrically. In fact, you saw a couple of demonstrations there, which I set off by pressing a button, and that was done using an electrical igniter. So I'm just going to show you an electrical igniter now. It looks just like the, the head of an ordinary match, just a little red bead, but it has these wires coming out of it. And when we apply a voltage to the wires, it produces a little burst of flame. So if you just look carefully at that match, I'll show you what that looks like when we apply a voltage. Okay. I mean, not the most spectacular demo of the lecture, but <laughs> it shows you how we can set fire to something electrically. And that's how modern professional firework displays are, are fired. They're all fired electrically. So here are some photographs from a professional firework display. This is one that I helped set up a couple of years ago. What you see here are those mortars, and they're all clamped into racks to keep them very rigid. And this firework display was done in a very long field with the audience sort of at right angles to the field. And we had 10 stations all the way along the field. And this was one or part of one of those stations. So you can see a lot of different mortars. Now each mortar has its own shell and each shell has its own electrical igniter. And what that means is that the field is also full of bundles of cables, thousands and thousands of cables running from all of these igniters. And these igniter cables all go into these kind of junction boxes which are placed in the field at various uh, intervals. And big cables from the junction boxes then go back to this central controller. And the central controller is plugged into a laptop computer, and it's actually the computer that's going to fire the display. So on the right-hand side there, each row is a separate igniter, a separate effect. And the timing of those is timed down to a hundredth of a second. So now we can do very, very precise effects. The, the display could even be set to music. We can produce very precise effects which depend upon very accurate timing of individual fireworks. So once you've done all the hard work of setting this up, all you have to do is press the red button and then sort of put your feet up and watch the display. So that's how modern professional firework displays are fired. Okay, so we've seen in this lecture a number of effects. We've seen how to make bangs, we've seen how to make colours, but there are hundreds of other effects that we can produce uh, uh, using interesting chemistry uh, to help us produce an interesting fireworks display. And I'm going to show you three of my favourite effects. And the, the first effect is called crackle. And crackle is a, a widely used effect. It's when you get an explosion followed by, a, or a bang, a shell, followed by thousands of little cracks or explosions all going off at the same sort of time. And that's produced using a particular type of star called uh, a crackle star. And I've got one here. I don't know if we can bring the camera in and have a look at this. So it's just a little cylinder of a material that's rather like compressed gunpowder. But embedded within the black powder is, uh, are, are some little brown lumps. And those are the crackle composition. When it one of those lumps is ignited, it 
that cracks with a sharp bang. And so when the star bur burns, we'll get a series of little cracks. And now if you imagine a shell with hundreds of these in, we get thousands of little explosions, all happening in very quick succession. So let's uh, see what happens when we set fire to this. So we'll put that in the hood. I think we might have the lights down for this. All right, so this is a crackle star. Okay, so that's the first effect. That's crackle. That's very widely used. Uh, you'll, you'll hear crackle at most fireworks displays these days. Now, the second effect that I rather like is a more subtle one. It's called strobing. And a strobe shell, you get an explosion, and then lots of twinkling light, little lights going on and off in the sky. It's rather pretty. And this is a picture of the explosion of a strobe shell, and it's a long exposure. This is a photograph taken over a period of several seconds, and if we just zoom in, what you can see are these trails in the sky. What's happening is that each of the stars is actually blinking on and off. It's flashing on and off. Now, instead of showing you a strobe star, I'm going to show you a ground firework that uses the same chemistry and has the same strobing effect. And so we'll, we'll put the lights down for this. And we see once it gets going, it's starting to flash. Now, what's very interesting here is the flashing is not caused by little particles, little lumps of flash material. This is just a single pyrotechnic composition. The flash is caused by some very complex chemistry. During the dark phase, some reaction products are being produced, and when they build up to a certain level, they themselves undergo a reaction to produce the flash. But the exact mechanism is not really understood. So even though fireworks are perhaps a thousand years old, there are still aspects of the chemistry of fireworks which are not fully understood, which are the subject of research and experiments, and people are still publishing papers on various theories of why this strobing effect should occur. Okay, so that's strobing, pyrotechnic strobing. So the third effect that I wanted to talk about is, again, a very familiar effect. It's the, the whistle, the pyrotechnic whistling sound. So how is that done? Oh, we have some sound effects. Good. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll make a pyrotechnic whistle in a minute. I bet it's louder than all of your whistles put together. We'll see. So how does it work, first of all? So a whistle is made from a cardboard tube, which is sealed off at the bottom, and then on top of the, uh, the base, we put some pyrotechnic composition, and that composition burns from the top downwards. So as it burns, the length of tubing between the top of the composition and the open end of the tubing, that length will increase as the composition burns down. Now that tubing acts a bit like a, an organ pipe or, a, or a, um, a musical instrument. The tubing produces a, a note at a particular pitch or a particular frequency which depends upon the length of that tubing. So as that length increases, the pitch of the note will fall. And I can illustrate that using a toy whistle. So this whistle has a transparent wall, and it has a piston inside that I can move up and down. What I'll do is I'll play the whistle, and as I do it, I'll move the piston down, and we should hear the change in the note. OK, so you hear the note falling. So the same thing happens with a pyrotechnic whistle. So here's a pyrotechnic whistle. This is actually um, fairly loud and it lasts for about five or six seconds. And what I want you to see is if you can notice the pitch falling as it burns. Okay, so that's the pyrotechnic whistle. Now, one of the things you notice about the whistle and about a lot of the other demonstrations is that we have this smoke. And that's because the chemistry produces reaction products which are solids at room temperature. And that's the cause of the smoke. 
And the smoke can be a good thing because sometimes it can reflect the colours and help you see the coloured light more clearly, but it can also be a problem. Uh, in a long display with lots of effects, the smoke can build up in the sky and it can start to obscure the effects. And of course, if you want to set off pyrotechnics indoors, then smoke can be a particular problem. So is there a different kind of chemistry that we could use that would do away with that smoke? Well, there is, and there's a very interesting story about how this was discovered. So this is a chemist, Christian Friedrich Schoenbein, who was quite a famous chemist. He made some important discoveries. He was also a very enthusiastic chemist. Because as well as doing experiments in his laboratory, he liked to do experiments at home on the kitchen table. Now, this is the middle of the 19th century, and in those days, the kitchen would have been uh, operated by his wife. That was his wife's domain, and she didn't like him doing these experiments, so she banned him from doing experiments in the kitchen. But one day, she was out of the house, and he, he couldn't resist, so he started to do some experiments with a mixture of concentrated nitric and sulfuric acids. So a very, very corrosive mixture, and unfortunately, he spilled some of this mixture on the kitchen table. So very quickly, he reached out for a cloth to wipe this up. But unfortunately, the cloth that he reached for was his wife's cotton apron. So he wiped up the nitric and sulfuric acids with the cotton apron, and then he hung the apron up to dry in front of the stove. And when it dried out, he got a little surprise. And let me show you what that surprise looked like. So this is a piece of cotton cloth. It's been treated with concentrated nitric and sulfuric acids, and it's been washed and dried, and the end result is unchanged. This looks and feels just like an ordinary piece of cotton cloth. But I'm going to set fire to it, and I want you to watch closely what happens. So let's see what happens when I burn this piece of treated cotton cloth. So, it seems to have disappeared. <laughs> What's happened? Well, it hasn't disappeared, of course. What's happened, of course, is that all of the reaction products are invisible gases. They're things like carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas and water vapour, things that are present in the air uh, already, and they're invisible gases, you can't see them. What was going on there is that when we treated the cotton with the nitric and sulfuric acids, a special process happened, we call it nitration, in which some nitrogen and oxygen has been incorporated into the actual molecules of the cloth. Now, cloth, cotton, is made out of a material called cellulose, and when we treat it with these acids, it becomes nitrocellulose. And so, whereas gunpowder is a mixture of the fuel and the oxidizer, in nitrocellulose, the actual molecules are changed. The oxygen is built into the molecule. So, we sort of have perfect mixing between the fuel and the, the oxidizer. So, that's a little piece of nitrocellulose. What I thought we'd do is to just show you a slightly larger quantity of uh, nitrocellulose. I think we'll put the lights down for this one. So again, this is the combustion of nitrocellulose, but this time uh, a slightly larger quantity. Okay, so that's nitrocellulose. Now, one of the nice things about fireworks is that we can combine effects. We can take two, idea, two ideas and we can combine them together to produce a new effect. And so we could take the idea of nitrocellulose and we could combine it with the chemistry we learned about colours, how to produce colours. So let's just remind ourselves of how we produce colours in pyrotechnic chemistry. And this time, instead of using the chemical names of the metals, I'll use their symbols. So for red, remember we use strontium. For orange, we use calcium. For yellow, we use sodium. For green, we use barium. For blue, we use copper. And if we want to make a complete rainbow, then if we're careful with the chemistry, we can get a purple colour by using a combination of strontium and copper, and that will give off a mixture of red and blue light, and we'll see that as purple. So let's just see what happens then when we combine nitrocellulose with this colour chemistry. So again, I think we'll put the lights down for this. So this is a combination of nitrocellulose and colour chemistry.
Okay, well, thank you very much. We are we're almost at the end of the lecture. Um, we probably need to go out with a little bit of a flourish, don't we? But, uh, but before we do, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'd just like you all to, to join me in, in saying a very big thank you to someone special, someone who's put in a huge amount of effort to helping to set up this lecture and also to deliver the lecture, and that's Chris Braxtone. And uh, just before we finish, I just want to go back and have a look at those light sticks. Now, remember, our prediction was that a higher temperature would produce a higher rate of reaction. And so we saw the hot light stick was glowing more brightly than the cold light stick. Now, that was about half an hour ago, so let's see what's happened in the meantime. So this is the cold light stick now, and this is the hot light stick. And if I put them together, you can see, well, I think they're almost just about the same brightness now. Maybe the, the cold one is even perhaps slightly brighter than the hot one. What's actually happening is that although the rate of chemical reaction should be higher when we have a higher temperature, because the reaction rate has been higher, it's been using up the materials faster, and so the density of materials has been falling. And so that fall in density has been lowering the reaction rate in the hot light stick, and that's been compensating for the higher temperature. And if we came back in about another half an hour, we'd find that the cold light stick was still glowing dimly, and the hot light stick has sort of burnt itself out. Okay. So that's the effect of temperature on reaction rate. So to end the lecture then, I thought, well, it's, uh, it's uh, bonfire night, it's November the 5th, and it's traditional on bonfire night to uh, sacrifice a model of Guy Fawkes. So we'll have a special model of Guy Fawkes made by Chris. And here he is, here's Guy Fawkes. <laughs> Now, this guy, Fawkes, is a little bit unusual because he's made entirely out of nitrous cellulose. <laughs> now, we need, to, we need to set fire to Guy Fawkes, and so I thought what we'd do is we'd use a piece of that old-fashioned black match, because Guy Fawkes would have known all about black match. So we'll use a piece of black match to set fire to Guy Fawkes. So uh, here's your last chance just to say goodbye to Guy Fawkes. And uh, I'll say goodbye to you, and thank you all for coming, and have a very enjoyable bonfire night. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> OK, well, um, I, I'm not sure how many of you, uh, either online or here, remember fireworks uh, from when they were younger, um, but uh, they were always... Uh, a favourite, particularly uh, in uh, November, and unfortunately these days it's something uh, that uh, that the children don't uh, get to uh, experience, and uh, probably a few of them are uh, more alive <laughs> today than they otherwise uh, would have been. Um, also, uh, you can't actually see it online, but we have a, a large uh, Saturn V uh, rocket over there that uh, Fred Crump has uh, kindly built, and um, during the break we'll fill it full of black powder and take it outside and, uh, and launch it. Take it down at Council Meesey, mate, don't worry about that. <laughs> anyway, please, you're talking a bit serious. I mean, when I grew up, we used to have a box of fireworks, but now it's more organised than that, because there was accidents, and then they had the parks where I live, and they said, we'll, we'll, we'll allow blokes to do the fireworks in this place. They don't have the old street fires anymore, and, Used to be all right. We used to have a good time with the old rose wood, but they don't make the fireworks like that now. No, it's sadly not. Oh, they did in Birmingham. There was about three or four fireworks companies. It was Wilders, Haynes, and Standard. You know, they was a big, they did they amalgamated and that. But and you know, the, uh, the the large shells and mortars look like a lot of fun as well. Yeah, but, uh, sadly, we'll not uh, get hold of any of those. Okay, well, well, we'll stop now for a, a tea break for uh, 10 minutes. So uh, those uh, online, if you uh, want to go and uh, uh, make a cup of yourself while we do that, we'll, we'll come back uh, at uh, 20 to 10, so 10, 10 minutes from now, and uh, continue on. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome back to uh, members in the uh, audience here and our home viewers uh, for June Sky for the month. Uh, thanks for Paul, Matt, uh, it normally does. And 
I've just got to five work out, so uh, be with you for a sec. Okay, as you can see from this slide, there's quite a bit actually happening this month, uh, although I am aware some of it has already happened, and uh, I'll still point it out because some of it can potentially still be seen. Uh, on the third of this month, we had Moon of Parity, uh, Parity sorry, and for the newer members, it basically means it was at its closest approach to Earth at uh, a paltry little 365,000 kilometres. Venus uh, reached its superior conjunction on the 4th of the 6th, and so that means it was between the Earth and the Sun, and uh, obviously not in a very good viewing position. And Mercury reached its maximum elongation east on the 4th of the 6th, so it basically meant it was about as far from the Sun and the eastern sky as it was going to get. Uh, quite a few comets here uh, at the moment, and I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, later on uh, in the PowerPoint. Uh, Pan stars, 1.2 degrees uh, east of Alpha uh, Ursa Major. Now, unfortunately, these ones are very much on the horizon and so not going to be all that uh, visible. Uh, tend to hang around in, in evening twilight. There's also Comet Linear uh, next to NGC 2392 in Gemini. Uh, and not going to be held by a full moon on the 6th of the 6th. Uh, Jupiter, two degrees north of the moon uh, at 3 a.m. Uh, on the 9th of the 6th. So what we have this month is quite a few uh, close associations uh, between planets and uh, the moon and uh, a few other things as well. Uh, of uh, note there on the 21st of the 6th is uh, the winter solstice. We're, uh, hopefully the day will start getting a bit longer and a bit warmer after that. And also on that uh, night is uh, the new moon, which essentially means we won't see anything because we're looking at the back of it. We won't get a, an eclipse because it's uh, not actually on the same plane at this stage. Uh, you've got Comet 2P Enki, uh, about 8 magnitude, which is about uh, the brightest of the comets uh, that were listed in uh, Astronomy 2020. And uh, in the evening twilight, about 8 to 10 degrees to the left of Pollux, which is one of the two stars in uh, Gemini. Coming up next month, uh, some fairly uh, interesting uh, stuff, which is worth, certainly worth viewing. You will have the Moon and Mars fairly close on the 12th of the 7th. And uh, on the 14th, Jupiter in opposition, on the 16th, Pluto in opposition, and on the 23rd, you've got Saturn in that uh, opposition. You also have Comet 88P Howe, 1.3 degrees northeast of Spica, uh, which is the bright star in Virgo. Now, uh, to give you a bit of an idea uh, of working out degrees, if you, you hold your arm out at full length, the width of your thumb is about half a degree. So we're looking at about, uh, what over there, about three thumb widths. The uh, June sky, uh, looking to the south, has a few interesting uh, objects uh, in the sky now. We're, we're actually starting to get into probably the best time of really for the year. Uh, just ignore uh, the positions of the planets there at the moment because uh, the stars are in the same position, but the planets are actually a year out. They've uh, changed since then. Uh, there are several uh, nebula and cluster up there at the moment. Uh, with the dumbbell cluster. Uh, this is actually fairly close to the, uh, it would be the north uh, eastern horizon and the wild duck cluster. Uh, for those at home, I'm actually pointing them out at the moment. Unfortunately, you, uh, you won't be able to uh, see what I'm pointing at. But these are up <coughs> in the top left hand corner of the uh, slide that's currently up. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've got the, the tail of Scorpio containing M7, which is an open cluster. And 
down the, the Milky Way, we have um, dual box decks and cracks. We also have uh, Ethan Faraday and the Southern Plains with uh, various shapes and clusters there uh, in that little area of the um, Milky Way. Uh, further up, we have uh, Aviva Centauri, which is in a fairly good viewing position at the moment. Uh, is apparently the best cluster in the sky uh, to look at. And down at the bottom of the slide, we have the Tarantula Nebula, which is in the larger Magellan in clear. <coughs> the sky looking north. The sky looking north, uh, both of the same things, except they're just around the other way. Uh, we're looking at that uh, comet near Spica. There's Spica there, which is in the uh, constellation of Virgo. And uh, I'm not exactly sure where it is from there, but it's, that's where you need to start looking. Um, most of the others, as I said, most of the others have already been uh, pointed out. And the uh, scanning didn't quite work at that top left hand corner. So, for this month, what are the planets up to? Uh, Mercury is visible in the western evening, western evening twilight. Uh, it's in the constellation of Gemini, and uh, which is fairly close to the horizon, and apparently it's sort of hanging around in the evening twilight, so it's not all that great for, uh, for viewing. It did reach its maximum elongation on the 4th of this month, and it's slowly now moving towards its inferior conjunction uh, on July 1st. So, as you can see, it, uh, it moves around the, the sun fairly quickly, uh, basically doing a, a quarter of a rotation or a quarter of an orbit every 22 days. So, uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, Venus has just moved through its inferior conjunction uh, on the 4th, which is uh, basically between us and the sun. Uh, the superior conjunction is with on the other side of the sun. And uh, as the month progresses, around mid-month, it uh, will reappear in the morning sky. So uh, very much for the, the more enthusiastic. As I uh, said earlier, Earth uh, reaches its solstice on the 21st of June. Uh, so hopefully the days will start to get a little bit longer and you won't all be getting up in the dark and coming home in the dark. For the other planets, uh, Mars will be at its western quadrature on the 7th. Now that uh, quadrature is when a line from Earth to the Sun and then Sun to Mars forms a 90 degree angle. And when it's in this position, you'll be able to see around about 84% of it. So it will actually appear as a gibbous um, uh, planet, similar to what, what you see with the Moon, and Venus and uh, Mercury. Uh, on the 12th and the 16th, which I do know was just uh, was yesterday actually, uh, Mars and Neptune are within two degrees of each other. Now they won't be all that far away from that, but the idea of two degrees is you can probably get both of them in an eyepiece of a reasonable sized telescope, and you can get a red planet and a blue planet in close proximity. So they would be a good photo opportunity. Jupiter uh, is now starting to move into the evening sky. Um, popping up a little bit before uh, midnight now, so uh, for those of us who like our sleep, it's, uh, it's moving into a good viewing position. Uh, at this stage, it's four major moons, uh, putting on a bit of a display, and I know Greg Walton has um, put stuff on the uh, Impact website, sorry, not the website, the email group, uh, about some of the uh, occultations and shadow uh, moving across the face of of Jupiter. Uh, Saturn rises around uh, 8 pm from mid month, and so uh, it's also starting to move into uh, a good viewing position. Uh, the rings are still tilted at 24 degrees, although they are apparently uh, in the process of uh, closing. And in 2025, the, uh, the rings will be side on to us for the first time in a while. So you'll be able to see Saturn without its rings. Uh, Uranus is in Aries. Uh, only visible in the early mo uh, eastern morning sky, uh, so another one for the really key. And Neptune 
appears stationary on the 24th and then moves retrograde. Now, what that basically means is it's just a, an anomaly of our uh, combined orbits, uh, the way the Earth moves. Uh, it looks like uh, against the background stars that uh, Neptune will actually remain stationary and then it starts to move, or appears to start to move backwards against the background stars. It uh, rises a little bit, uh, bit before midnight, and uh, as uh, told previously, on the 12th and 16th, very close encounter between it and Mars. So the appearance of the planets of the month, uh, Mercury is in superior conjunction, which means it's on the other side, and that's the 1st of July on the other side of the sun, so you really won't go and see it. And um, Venus has just been through its inferior conjunction uh, on the 4th, so what you'll actually start to see is the uh, crescent on the other side of the uh, planet now. It's going to swap sides, but we're still largely looking at the back of it, but it is still fairly bright. Only problem is it's a boring object now. Uh, Saturn, as I said, has the rings uh, still tilted very nicely towards us for those who uh, want to see Saturn in its ring system. And Jupiter, in my opinion, is always pretty spectacular when it's up. And uh, interesting to watch the movement of particularly its four main moons. Uranus, not much more than a little uh, bluey green disc. Neptune is uh, generally a, a blue dot. And Pluto is one of those stars in the Sagittarius area of the sky. The other stuff going on at the moment, uh, I think there's a few more comets that have been discovered in recent times uh, than these ones, but these are the four that were actually mentioned in Astronomy 2020. Uh, 88P now uh, is an evening target, it's around 10th magnitude, so it's uh, not exactly the brightest object up there. It's currently moving westward through the constellation of Virgo. Comet uh, 249P, Linear, is low in the evening sky in Gemini and it's actually probably got just a bit too low to, uh, to view uh, or to catch now. Uh, Enki reaches perihelion at about Mercury's orbit, so it actually starts to uh, uh, swing around and uh, head back out into the solar system. It doesn't actually go uh, around the sun, it, it actually drops short of it, it only goes into Mercury's orbit. It may be visible towards the end of the month, uh, about 8 to 10 degrees to the left of Pollux, uh, one of the two main stars in Gemini, uh, but it may also be lost in uh, evening, to, uh, evening twilight there. So uh, if it is visible, it's around about 8 magnitude. And comet pan stars, uh, unfortunately best viewed from northern Australia, so it's going to be fairly low on the northern horizon. It should be or may be visible towards the end of the month in Ursa Major, and at around 7th magnitude, uh, it's, it's almost getting to the stage it's a naked eye object. Uh, may also be lost in evening twilight. The minor planets, uh, by minor planets I mean asteroids and uh, Kuiper belt objects that are uh, visible or in opposition this month, essentially being uh, probably in their best positions to view. But when you look at the magnitude of uh, some of them there, uh, you're not going to see it with the naked eye. But uh, for the truly enthusiastic and potential uh, objects for astrophotography over a couple of nights and uh, just see these little objects move. And coming to the end now, uh, the next episode of Steve O's Solar System Tour, we're going to have a look at uh, our smallest planet, which is uh, Mercury. Mercury, it was named for the Roman god Mercury, uh, who was the fleet footed messenger of the gods. Uh, generally, the uh, agents who uh, monitored and watched it reckoned it. Uh, pretty well whizzed around the sun fairly quickly, which it uh, generally does. It's the smallest and innermost planet of the solar system, uh, with a diameter of 4,880 kilometres, and thought it would then go around on its own, has no moons. Now, the distance from the sun, uh, it's fairly significant, nearly 58,000 kilometres, which 
very little hard to understand. I'll put a 0.4 AU. That stands for 0.4 astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. So the Earth is one AU. So it tells you that uh, Mercury is 0.4 of the distance from the Sun that Earth is. Has an orbital period of 88 days and generally like Venus can be viewed before uh, sunrise or after sunset and uh, that's because it pretty well runs around the place with the sun. It's basically a little rock being absolutely pummeled by uh, meteorites. It, it is the most uh, damaged planet in the solar system by all accounts. It uh, also has an extremely large mesh core. Uh, people at home can't see this, but most of it is actually metal, with uh, some of the surface or exterior surface being rock. And apparently, theory goes that a lot of its lighter surface material is blown away by the solar wind, including whatever atmosphere it may have had. Uh, due to its small size and lack of gravity to be able to hold it there. And as a comparison, these are the four rocky planets of our solar system. Mercury on the left there, as you can see, it is uh, not much smaller than Mars, but it is a little bit smaller there. And uh, Earth and Venus, about the same size. And tonight's information provided by Astronomy 2020 by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. And that concludes Sky for the Month. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, today I'm reporting from planet Earth, right by the edge of our inland sea. Standing on this spinning Earth, we are being flung fast towards the rising sun in front of me. In not many hours, the sun will set behind me. And in not many days, we in the Southern Hemisphere will be flung furthest into darkness. And that means our June winter solstice The solar planetary orbits are shown as anti-clockwise, looking southwards. Interesting to note, that is not where you stand, but which direction you look. An example is Big Dipper, from anywhere, say the US or here. If looking in the same direction, that is towards north, Big Dipper looks the same, not upside down. Orbits are not always circles, so we see some wonderfully elongated orbits of comets. Here's Comet Lemons. Now I'll lead you up and down the garden path. We'll look at orbits down to too small to see and up to too vast to see. Let's look at some fractal aspects of orbits. A fractal is a shape made of parts similar to the whole in some way, such as the Buckminster Fullerene carbon 60 on the top right. On its left is the most famous example of a mathematically generated fractal for you to research on. 
Now, does something of the structure remind you of something about COVID-19? The self-similar, self-generating feature can be seen everywhere, everywhere. Bottom left is the sand line on the scale of my boots. Next to it, the coast of Africa. Next, some rocks just off the beach. Far right, a satellite image of Great Britain. Orbits and fractals are everywhere. Top left, atom with electrons orbiting. Bottom left, 2019, quantum energy transitions of buckyball carbon-60 using frequency combs or rulers of light. I haven't read the details yet. Next right, the DNA double helix as a structure. Orbital or, in fact, cyclical movements happen in our very bodies with blood circulation and breaths. And when we die, we become bits of decay or ash and recycle. Surface waters to clouds to rain are cyclical as well. Now look at the spiral pattern both of cyclones and of galaxies. Like those of plants and seashells, spirals are the low energy configurations they are self-organizing fractals. From a fractal viewpoint, cyclical events may scale down to beyond atom and up through to how about beyond the universe. Electrons cycle around atomic nucleus. The moon cycles around the earth. Earth cycles around the sun. The sun cycles around the Milky Way's galactic center. Now galaxies cycle around what? Then the whole universe cycles around what? That what in turn cycles around what next? And I'd say Big Bang, maybe not likely not in my opinion and you are not meant to believe this or anything even the best of best scientific statements are opinions based on the thinking and the available information up to that time we build on by standing on the shoulders of giants and by exploring. To think about not Big Bang, see the straight part of this sine wave. It shows that an extrapolation does not mean continuing at the same slope. Psychical events 
or oscillations seem more likely, especially when viewed as fractals. In mass movements or energy transitions, cyclical changes have a measure. Repetitions or revolutions or cycles per unit time, that's frequency. It is a natural and an everyday, every subsequent event to see and hear in frequencies, to register the differences and qualities in frequency, changing in time, like voices, like bird song, like music, like vibrations, like bandwidths, like colors. Thank you, birds. You are hearing my voice and the birds as frequency patterns changing in time. In astronomy, that means an astronomically amazing tool, spectroscopy. Next month's planned presentation by Dr. Madley on exoplanets will cover spectroscopy. Please keep your eyes agog and your ears are flapping. See frequencies, see spectroscopy. Well, I hope you have enjoyed the travel up and down the fractal path that has taken us from orbits and solstice down to atoms and beyond, then up to planets, comets, galaxies, to cyclical events, and possibly not Big Bang, then to the whole universe possibly orbiting something that's orbiting something else. I'll leave you with the next slide as a short happy solstice and bye until next cyclical time. sent it by, uh, by Sky Murphy. Now what I'll do is I'll show you uh, a, a three or four uh, short, uh, shortish clips. The first one is about um, Athelian and... Do that? Athelian it's the 6th of July. Which means we're actually the farthest from the sun that we get all year. Which is crazy because of the insane heat. Let's uh, go out into the sun, put this things, camera on a telescope, and uh, have a look at it, shall we? So here's the scope. You can see I've got a sun shield on the front so we can have a look at the sun. And a mount for my camera. Okay, and there it is, the sun. <laughs> Camera's going to adjust the brightness down to the point where I can't really see it. Hopefully you guys can see it better. It doesn't look like there's any sunspots right now. So it's going to be a pretty boring view like disk of the sun. There it is, the sun at Aphelion. Well, I guess the Earth's at Aphelion. The sun is just kind of at the same spot. But this is the farthest from it we're going to get all year. So I'm going to take some screenshots of this and we can take some pixel measurements and then see if we come back during uh, perihelion if it'll be any bigger. Shouldn't be by much. The Earth only varies in distance by about 2%, 2 or 3%. But as long as I use the same telescope and the same camera, we should be good to go.
All right, so here we are about six months later. It's currently 10 a.m. on January 2nd, 2019. A lot of things have changed. As you can see, the bees are no longer bearded. In fact, they're all bundled up tight. Uh, the city made me mow my sugar beets, so they're no longer here. Although I would have gotten rid of them by now anyway. Uh, my armor is taking shape and it's rather cold. Uh, in fact, if I scrape the frost off the thermometer here, you can see that uh, it's well below freezing. So, let's go have a look at the sun. Alright, so here's the setup. Same as what I had back in July. Same camera, same telescope. You notice there's no lens here, so it's just shining directly onto the sensor. Uh, so even if the camera's settings are different, the actual size of the image should be the same, assuming the sun is at the same distance, which it shouldn't be. And there it is. The sun viewed from the Earth at perihelion. So it looks about the same. Looks like we do have a small sunspot there. Uh, Size-wise, it looks about the same, which that makes sense since it shouldn't be that much different. And I am looking at it on the display of my camera. We'll get this in uh, onto the other computer so we can actually do some measurements. With the photos placed side by side, it is now quite easy to see that the sun does indeed appear larger now that we're at perihelion. But just to make sure and to get some actual numbers, I put the photos into MS Paint and did a simple pixel measurement, which you can see here. I also calculated the area, and the sun at perihelion is about 93% as large as it is at perihelion, which corresponds to approximately that level of brightness difference. So now a lot of you are probably wondering why it is that if we are closer to the sun in January, it appears larger, we're receiving more energy from it, how could we be colder in January than it is in July? The answer to that is that the brightness of the sun really doesn't affect the Earth's climate all that much. Uh, it's just not that big of a change. The tilt of the Earth is way more significant. Uh, since we are in the Northern Hemisphere, we happen to be facing away from the sun, the angle is different, we're encountering less light, and so it gets colder. If you're in the southern hemisphere, the opposite is true, and in fact, it does get hotter during the summer, and southern summers should actually be hotter than northern summers, given all the same variables. So, hope you enjoyed, we'll see you next time. If you've ever seen web-like or squirmy shapes or shadows moving through your plane of vision when you look at something brightly lit, then you've probably experienced a floater. Let's take a look. Floaters are a common complaint, and eye doctors are used to explaining what they are to their patients. Behind the lens, you have the vitreous cavity, which is filled with a vitreous jelly-like material. And that vitreous is attached to the retina, which is the back wall of the eye, at several different locations. And if that vitreous separates away from the back of the eye, the area where it was connected is visible as a floater. When patients see the floater, they're seeing these little clumps or strands of vitreous. I can see your floater. For Ms. DeWitt, this just happened a couple months ago, so she's not quite used to the floater, but you generally with time, patients do okay. About 50% of people by age 50 end up having floaters. But can the floaters be safely removed? No. No. Generally speaking, we don't treat these vitreous floaters. Vitreous surgery can be performed to remove all of the floaters and all of the gel of the eye. But there are risks to that surgery, including retinal detachment, cataract, infection. In general, floaters are typically observed and tolerated. So when should you be concerned about floaters? 
Experts warn if you should develop a sudden onset of bloaters, get to the eye doctor. About 15% of people who come in with a new uh, vitreous attachment, they will also have a retinal tear. The vitreous jelly can pull on the retina. And as it pulls, the brain perceives that as flashing lights. That's the signal that it sends. And so if that vitreous is pulling on the retina, that could create a tear or a hole in the retina. So it's important to have that checked. All right, look up into your left. We basically put laser marks in a circle around the tear to sort of barricade the tear so that fluid can't get behind the tear to cause a retinal detachment. The people that are at a higher risk for developing vitreous floaters include people who are nearsighted and people that have had cataract surgery and people that have had cataract surgery and then have a what we call a YAG laser following the cataract surgery. But for most people who see floaters, nothing more than a minor nuisance. assume here that everyone has some floaters. Floaters yeah. are very thick as you get older, particularly if you're short sighted. They happen when the jelly inside your eye breaks down. The jelly is made up of collagen, so strands of material. And as we age, the jelly naturally becomes more liquid. And so these strands float around more than they do with the other. Because you see the shadow that the strand casts on your retina, rather than the actual strand itself, you see that it's black. And people describe them as spiders or snakes or sometimes cobwebs. As we get older and the jelly inside our eye shrinks away from the back of the eye, sometimes it can tug on the retina. And the retina is the light sensitive membrane that lines the inside of our eye. And when the jelly tugs on the retina, you see it. The retina is designed to detect light. And you'll see it as a flash of light. People often describe it as like a lightning. When that happens, sometimes that tug can cause a little tear in the retina. And if that happens, that tear can then go on to develop into a retinal detachment. And that is an ocular emergency. So the signs to look out for that might indicate that floaters could be the sign of something in the skin are either if you get a sudden shower of floaters coming across your sight. Or if you get a new large floater appearing in your sight. Or if you get floaters associated with a flash of light, because that can indicate that there's been that little tug on the retina. The most important symptom to look out for is if you get a veil of curtain come across your sight from any direction but does not go away. If you have a retinal detachment, you really need to go to the eye casualty department as soon as you can and within 24 hours. And if you don't, then that can tell you that you affect your sight. If you have any problems or any concerns about your eyes, contact your local optometrist. Details can be found on the Department of Eyes Doctor. And one last one on floaters. If you've noticed some dark spots in your vision, or maybe strings that look like cobwebs, you may have what are called eye floaters. They're more common in nearsighted people and also more common as we age. These floaters may drift about when you move your eye and may appear to dart away when you look directly at them. They may be most noticeable when you look at a plain, bright black uh, background like the blue sky or a white wall. So what are floaters? Does it mean that you're dying? Which is what I thought the first time I was going to have one. And are they a cause for concern? Here to discuss eye floaters is Mayo Clinic ophthalmologist Dr. Amir Khan. Welcome to the program, Dr. Khan. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, Tom and Tracy. Um, First of all, I would say you probably are not dying. Okay, good. Yeah, but she's too young for a floater, isn't she? <laughs> right, can you get them at all ages? Is there a certain age for floaters? There's not a certain age, uh, particularly as you mentioned, the more nearsighted people, uh, they can notice floaters often at an earlier age. So I wouldn't necessarily have an age cut off for floaters. Um, and what causes them? What are you really experiencing? Most of the time, and this isn't in all cases, but most of the time, what the floaters are are bits and clumps of your vitreous, which is a gel substance in the back of the eye. So the inside part of the eye is filled with a gel. Correct. And these are little chunks of gel. Dust. <laughs> dust? <laughs> what are they? Chunk is maybe not the right word. <laughs> maybe clump. Yeah. A clump of jelly. Um, so as we age, what is initially a firm gel-like substance begins to liquefy. And as it liquefies, it can contract and break up into bits and pieces. Those bits and pieces are what 
you may notice as a floater and what I can see as a floater when I look into your eye. Please so you can see them, the person can see them, but you can actually see them if you look in someone's eye with a ophthalmoscope? Um, maybe not with a ophthalmoscope, but with other uh, viewing devices. It, right, your eye care provider can observe those floaters as well. Are they of concern? The floaters themselves are more of a nuisance annoyance type problem where, as Tracy mentioned, if you look at a blue sky or a white page, they become more noticeable. Where it becomes a concern is if they're associated with something else. For example, as this jelly substance contracts and breaks up, it, it's in clumps, it pulls away from the retina. The, now, the retina is like the film of the camera, the back of the eye, what you see with it. Correct. Okay. Correct. So as it pulls away from the retina, it can tug on the retina, and that can give you flashing lights. And that tugging can sometimes tear the retina. So if fluid from within the eye gets in underneath that tear, the retina can separate kind of like wallpaper off a wall, and that's a retinal detachment. So we really recommend that anybody who has a new onset of floaters uh, sees their eye care provider for a dilated eye exam to make sure that the retina is intact. Those ones, those floaters would not go away though. Is that right? If, if you've got a detached retina, it's not going to, like a, usually a floater, you see it and then it's gone. The floaters that we have from the jelly, the vitreous breaking up into bits and clumps, really don't go away completely either because the back of the eye is kind of a closed space. So they may shrink a little on time and the brain may learn to ignore them a little bit over time. But again, in certain situations, particularly with the lighting, uh, they can be more noticeable. So is it fair to say that if you do have floaters, you're more likely to have a detached retina or to experience a detached retina? Um, not necessarily, because I would say the majority of people, as we age, get floaters, but only the minority end up with a retina problem. But it's not more common. Retinal detachment is not necessarily more common in people who do have floaters. Or if you flip it around, I would say everybody with a retinal detachment probably has floaters. Oh, really? To start, because that's the primary for most people. That's what, that's what it looks like. Um, because that's how most retinal detachments start with the jelly substance pulling away and tearing the retina providing that spot for fluid to get in. So if you have never had a floater, or never seen a floater, experienced a floater, it's unlikely that you're going to have a retinal detachment. Is that fair? Less likely. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's look at it the other way. So in general, when you have a floater, it's not that big of a deal, not, not cause for concern. But what what can be a cause for concern if it sh if it changes if you have more floaters or what are some of the things that you should look for? I've had floaters and I just I see them and then they're gone. Yeah, and, I, and I'm pretty nearsighted. I've had yeah. floaters for a long time. Um, the fire we see all of a sudden shower of little specks, almost like little black bugs, and people patients may say that there's a gnat there or some flies there and they try to swat them away, but they're not outside; they're inside their eye. Uh, those can be causes for concern. The other thing is not all floaters are clumps of the vitreous jelly. So sometimes if the retina is torn, it can be a broken blood vessel. And those may be blood cells that you're seeing. Also in certain uh, underlying diseases such as diabetes, uh, those people are more prone to getting uh, blood vessels that can break and bleed easily. So that may also be a source of floaters. So any onset of new floaters, I think, really deserves a, a dilated eye exam. Why are floaters more common in people who are near sighted? It's probably because the eye, most people near sighted eye tends to be longer. And the wider or front to back or side to side? Uh, front to back. Okay. Um, it tends to be longer. So the thought is that there might be more traction on the retina and because things are stretched a little bit more in the eye. Is there a treatment for it? Uh, there really isn't a treatment for floaters. Um, recently, people started looking into whether they can laser the floaters um, by breaking up into smaller pieces. I, I think the jury is still out on that. 
Technically, uh, a retina specialist can go inside of the eye and remove all of the gel substance, um, but that has its own inherent risks as well. And for something that is typically more of a, let's say, nuisance annoyance type issue, we don't recommend doing that. So if you like, you know, you were at the playing a game, you know, it, and you're looking inside the eye and you've got the laser there and you, you, see, you see a photo that people are doing that. They are, and then that, and then I that can break up. I did not want that. I did not want you to be doing that. I'm sorry. I'm continue. not a very good shot. And you're, you're right. Um, but then there is, in my mind, there's some concern about breaking those bigger folders up into more smaller pieces, plus releasing all that energy into that part of the eye. Is there a way to prevent floaters? I mean, there's um, from macular degeneration, you know, there's vitamins. Is, is there ways that you can prevent it? Not really, okay. not really. Again, this whole process of the of the vitreous gel liquefying is I put it more in the natural aging category. So when my kids say that they have a floater, if I were to say you're having that, experiencing that because you're not eating enough vegetables, that would probably not be true. <laughs> But um, it's, it would still be good. Depending, depending on the age of your kids, okay. that still wouldn't be valid advice. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so you, you've told us that if you have floaters for the first time, and in particular if you have multiple ones, it's probably worth a checkup. Let's talk about, we've got a minute or so remaining. Tell us about some other changes in vision or eye symptoms that ought to be checked out, that um, ought to make you go see an ophthalmologist or at least your family physician to have a checkup. You know, in addition to floaters, if you notice an area of your vision is missing, uh, that would be another good reason uh, to get a dilated eye exam. Like if you can't see the right half or the top or the bottom or correct. something like that. Correct, because that could be a sign of a retina problem, it could be a sign of an optic nerve problem. Right. Reduce field of vision. Reduce field of vision. vision. Reduce visual acuity. You just can't see as clearly. Um, it may be something simple, like you need to get a new glasses prescription, but again, it could be anything else from cataract or macular degeneration. That's tricky because it happens so gradually that you don't notice what you don't notice. Correct. And oftentimes people don't notice until maybe for some reason they rub one eye, and then all of a sudden they're looking with their bad eye, and you know, when did this happen? All right, anything else we got to worry about? Um, in terms of the eyes? Yeah. In terms of <laughs> Well, we got lots to worry about, it, but things that ought to prompt one to go see their eye doctor. Um, just in general, I would say um, every few years it's probably reasonable to get an eye exam to measure things like the pressure inside your eye. Some things may be asymptomatic and best caught early, so I think routine eye care is important. All right, see your doctor every three years, or sooner if you need it, Very especially good. if you're new to floaters. Okay. <laughs> All right, we've been talking about eye floaters with a Mayo Clinic specialist, ophthalmologist Dr. Amir Khan. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Khan. Good to have you on the program. And just sharing with you, uh, before we uh, actually have, used to have uh, public viewing nights up here at the site, we used to hold them down at the visitor center and on one of the evenings, uh, our president at that particular time um, ended up with a, a retinal detachment during it. And uh, like, like I said there, if, uh, if you're not looking through the bad eye, you don't actually notice it, and he didn't actually notice it. Uh, it didn't really become clear to him until he actually got home afterwards, so uh, well, they can, uh, can occur. Now, one uh, short one here about averted vision, issued by NASA. And goes for a couple of minutes, and you'll see the wonderful acting that, uh, that they do. I'll demonstrate the use of the color and the verdant vision card. This card can be used at night at the telescope or in a darkened room. Of course, to shoot this video, we require a lot of light, so in the video, you will not see what you would see with your eyes in the dark. Please consider this only a demonstration of how to use the card. First, let's look at the color side of the card. We're looking at a distant galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. I thought I'd see more color. Most of the pictures you see in magazines are in color, so it might be disappointing not to see much color in the telescope. Our eyes just cannot detect much color in dim light. Here, can you tell me what colors these squares are? When we look through the scope, for the most part, our eyes only see shades of gray. What colors do you see? Mostly gray, there might be some green. Okay, now what colors do you see? I see blue and red and some yellow. 
We don't have as many color receptors in our eyes as black and white receptors. Also, our eyes' colors receptors are not as sensitive. We need a lot of light for our eyes' colors receptors to detect any color at all. When we look at dim objects that are far out in space, there is so little light reaching us that only our black and white receptors can detect the light. Take another look. That galaxy sure is dim. It looks just like a fuzzy cat. You're right. Only a little of its light is reaching us. Let me show you a way to use the part of your eye that is most sensitive to light so you can see more detail. We'll use a technique called averted vision. It's really easy. Close one eye. Look directly at the galaxy image in the middle. Now, look at the black dot away from your nose. I see that your right eye is open, so you would look to the dot on the right. The image might appear to be a little brighter, but the effect works better in the telescope. When you look into the telescope eyepiece at the dim object, look to the side away from your nose, about as close to the object as this dot is to this photo. The object you're viewing will appear brighter and you'll see a little more detail. That is better. This is important. If you look in the direction of the dot toward your nose, you are centering your eye's blind spot over the image, making the object disappear. Avert your vision in the correct direction, away from your nose. There's more information on why this works in the manual. One final video before we close. This one is uh, one that some of you may have seen in the past over uh, using a pirate's eye patch. And maybe we need some eye patch uh, merchandise for selling at the public yards when we eventually get them up here again. <laughs> now with that, I'll uh, close the evening with um, Catriona uh, Nguyen Robinson. Bring that up. Hi, my name is Katerina, and this is a song that's dedicated to all of the researchers and clinicians around the world who are trying to solve COVID-19. Solving COVID-19 while in quarantine, putting the puzzle together, looking for a cure or vaccine, cause we're really keen to get out of our house. The virus makes the immune system fight Immune cells can tell that something's not right So we get what's called a cytokine storm As all of your immune cells get the signal to swarm The lungs become a site of inflammation We're still trying to find the exact causation A lot of the pathology is caused when you fight back Rather than the virus trying to attack Solving COVID-19 while in quarantine puzzle together looking for a cure or vaccine cause we're really keen to get out of our houses can a vaccine generate train immunity in order to protect the whole community we can make vaccines that generate antibodies which are long lived proteins that recognize the virus kept inside our bodies some of the vaccines might target our T cells which kill infected cells or send up alarm bells all of these things remember the virus and launch an attack if it ever gets inside us solving COVID-19 while in quarantine putting the puzzle together looking for a cure or vaccine cause we're really keen to get out of our houses all of us are trying to stop virus transmission but it's really hard if you can't tell your condition about 40 percent of people have no sign they go about their daily lives thinking they're fine for all the other people who get really sick we're testing different drugs to help them feel better quick solving COVID-19 while in quarantine putting the puzzle together because we're really keen to get out of our houses. Catriona is known as the uh, singing immunologist and she studied at the Peter Dozy Institute and um, you may get her to speak with us uh, early next year. So with that, 
I'll uh, call them in. I see we have three online. Um, I'm not sure whether they they've fallen asleep online, <laughs> or, <laughs> because uh, we've been having quite a quite a bit of problem with the video uh, being transmitted out. Uh, so maybe two or three frames a second. I'd be seeing it. So, uh, uh, if, if you are still online and you do three, you've been very patient. Okay. Thank you, everyone.